So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you in the stakeholder dialogue um, under the title Beyond 2015, What Next for Water-Related MDGs and Water Challenges. This uh, group collectively represents a fair, group, a fair uh, chunk of the international community uh, dealing with water issues. We have paid uh, significant attention to the uh, both the International Water Decade and to the Millennium Development Goals, particularly those that relate to water. Uh, and uh, much of our work associates and, and aligns with uh, addressing those uh, aspects. And we have already started looking at uh, how we are addressing the MDGs at the moment. And one key item was the launch of the five-year drive to sanitation, uh, which was launched earlier this year in New York. And the idea there is that sanitation is the target on which we are the farthest behind, and we have to make a concerted effort to meet that. And we're saying if we take a step back and look at the, uh, the perspective of the so-called bottom billion or the forgotten billion, the same people who are living below poverty line, who don't have access to energy, don't have access to water or sanitation, and fall below any appreciable well-being indicator that you can think of. Federico said there is life after the MDGs, and so we have to um, think now about what we will have um, um, in terms of targets and indicators and how we're going to monitor those um, uh, after that time so that we get an orderly transition from one to the other. Um, but the starting point is to know that, of course, by 2015 there will still be 700 million people estimated without access to safe drinking water. There will unfortunately be about 2.7 billion people without access to um, basic sanitation. Um, so on that premise, um, we um, developed the idea between WHO and UNICEF to have a, a first consultation on the issue of, you know, how we're going to formulate targets and indicators post-2015. And the other thing that happened, of course, in 2010 and then with a the follow-up in 2011, which was very, very important in this whole concept, was the adoption of the resolutions by the UN General Assembly and later on by the uh, Human Rights Council of the Human Right to Water, which came not only with these statements, but also with its own set of criteria. Um, you know, what, how can we actually monitor whether countries meet the obligations under this human rights uh, arrangement, um, and also with the concept of progressive realization. So I think this is very important to remember because it's very nice to set another aspirational target of, uh, you know, getting universal coverage by 2030, um, but I think it's also important to make sure um, that uh, governments are held to a more gradual progress towards this goal um, and that's what the framework for human rights provides. Thank you. And I would like to talk about uh, uh, the field experiences which is also relevant to Asia mostly and uh, let me start by talking about the war in Afghanistan. Why am I talking about the war in Afghanistan? Because recently I read that the US Marines had put up the first female engagement team and I think that what they have done certainly has some lessons for us in the water sector. Now, they've put up with this female engagement team which could go and meet with women who are confined within their households. Quite a lot of South Asia and Central Asia and uh, maybe also East Asia has a very conservative society. So it is difficult for people who are not women to reach out to this half of humanity, half of Asia, who is within the confines of their homes, within the confines of their communities. So the second thing that this female uh, engagement team of the U.S. Marines did was they had specific questions on health. They, would wa they wanted to engage and get information on health. But uh, they met with a bit of a surprise. The women didn't want to talk about health. They wanted to talk about security. They wanted to know, you know, uh, is the Taliban going to attack them? Uh, how safe are they at night? So this again gives me another lesson that sometimes what we need, what we talk, what we as development practitioners uh, request is not what the community wants, 
why is it so difficult for us to have a gender perspective especially in asia but i think our issues are the issues are also relevant to other parts of the world one is the lack of gender desegregated data if you do not have data you do not get a seat at the table and very often there is no gender desegregated data and because of that there is a poor visibility of the situations a poor visibility of people their perceptions their needs and with that a poor recognition of the issues the relevance of the issues i'll say many african countries will yeah and i think the gmp confirms that if everything goes on right and the economic growth rates at 5 or 6% continues for the next 5 years and nothing bad happens to their internal uh, development issues when it comes to sanitation i think africa will join the rest of the world by not meeting those targets and before i even elaborate further on it i would like to say that i hope that post 2015 in setting the targets we look at the 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 the, the indicators we use very closely was i i have a, somebody shared with me a paper which shows that the gap between africa and the rest of the developing world if measured i mean the first two i mean different mdg indicators are either positive or negative for example the water mdg is negative and if you took the same data and you looked at how many people have gained access to water since 2000 the gap between africa and the rest of the world will close much further than if you took a negative indicator but that's not the point the point is that it has been a very useful tool for african governments to make certain changes which are evident and some those who are interested can join the african focus tomorrow where some of this will be illustrated overall i believe that uh the targets of 2015 for water will be met by many african countries not all the target for sanitation will be tougher to meet but by 2025 there will be progress and i believe that the with support the african water vision can be realized by 2025 that's all i can contribute thank you but if you look to the to the countries like poland hungary czech republic croatia these countries who are just 20 years of transition now of course there's also a lot of uh, things has happened in, in the last years drinking water i think it's not uh, the amount of drinking water is not the problem in these european countries normally we have water there this is not the problem of course the quality is uh, slightly different if you have a good quality of your of your own wells at home rural areas and uh, urban areas of course there's a difference in sanitation again there's more, much more to do and um, uh, it's also the question uh, how many are connected to to uh, uh, systems to centralized systems or even to septic tanks because most of the people in rural area they have their septic tanks and that works out So coming to the conclusion I think uh, East European countries they are lucky that the money is more or less uh, many countries available not as much as we had in the East European German countries of course but uh, it, it, a lot of things are constructed the question is who who r- runs it who runs the show later on it's not the engineers and not we sitting here and being on conference we are not the people who go into a manhole if there must be other people who know how to do that i think that is very very important to keep a systematic uh, uh, approach we have examples from china and from other countries where germany built a lot of wastewater treatment plants and after 2 years 3 years nobody wanted to see them anymore because uh, they were rotten nobody uh, cleaned it nobody repaired it so what is the sense to make the investment if you don't have people who maintain it So I very strong want to recommend on this and because it's a capacity development not only for the academics but also for the workers who repair and maintain this, this uh, infrastructure. Thank you very much. My name is Josefina Maestu. I am the director of the UN Water Decade program on advocacy and communication. I have a question for Robert Boss. Robert you you mentioned that uh, that the the resolution on water as a human right has made a difference that they have already there is some criteria there that that's, that criteria is being used really to 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 produce these indicators you know this set of indicators but we, you haven't really tell us anything about any specific examples of the kind of indicators that may 
that you may be developing to, to look into accessibility, safety, affordability, sustainability. Is there anything else you can tell us about that? Josefina, um, no, I think that um, we're now at the stage where we have to start the debate on how to develop these uh, targets and indicators. Um, and that's why I refer to the fact that the JMP has organized some task forces already that responded to earlier request, requests. Like, I think the, the one that probably panned out best was the one on um, water quality, so that has to do with safe drinking water, um, where we looked at the need to develop um, uh, rapid techniques that can, and affordable techniques that can test drinking water quality in the context of household surveys. Um, maybe expand on an experience we had as JMP with the rapid assessment of drinking water quality in a number of countries. And also see how we can use information that is available with drinking water quality, regu drinking water regulators in many countries who routinely do surveys um, of drinking water quality, but particularly in urban areas. Hi, my name is Kate Norgrove. I'm head of campaigns at WaterAid. Um, I just had a question for the colleague from JMP. Sorry, I didn't, didn't catch your name. Um, you talked about a smooth transition to post-2015, and yet it seems to me that all the evidence on creating global agreements at the moment are that it, it's not at all a smooth process. Sue Yardley from um, NJ Tier Fund in the UK. Um, my question is a bit broad in terms of the framing of sort of beyond 2015. And um, I, I know one of the panelists mentioned about climate change adaptation. And um, I think it's really important that the, um, in terms of sort of plans and policies around water and sanitation, that it takes account of climate change adaptation. Just be interested to hear the, the panel's views on that, because it's not been very prominent um, in the, the current MDGs, but it's going to be really important going forward in terms of water resource management. Myself from India, is it possible to treat the sewage of a municipality or the corporation and use it for the, as a raw water for the industry so that private developer can maintain his effluent? Implant, uh, maintain that treatment plant and he will sell that uh, discharge to the industry so that can be properly maintained, which will be a revenue source. Yes, it uh, depends on, on the quality of the sludge. If you have a lot of industry uh, connected to your, your wastewater network, then you get a lot of heavy metals into your sludge and then nobody wants to have this sludge. If you have a very good quality, of course, then you can make a, make a kind of business out of it, or you can go bring it for incineration, but it depends on the, on the quality of, of your system. But I never saw an investor who says, I'm, I'm running the city of, of a big city or a small city. I never saw an, a private investor, because whatever you get from, from the city, you don't know what you get, and you don't have a lot of influence. And you get a lot of hand, rainfall, then you get a lot of things. And then you have a dry period, so it's not a constant thing what you can calculate. So I never saw, and I travel a lot in the world, I never saw an investor who says I'm taking that over. I only saw people and, and private companies who say I take it over to run it for a while and get money for that, but uh, not uh, to sell things out of the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, do we have any plans to take water to areas where uh, like countries where we really do not have water resources and they are running out of food and water and so on. That's okay. what I mean. Yeah, that's very clear now. And yes, I know that, uh, let me, you mentioned examples of Eastern the Horn of Africa. I don't know any, of, any uh, plans to transfer water there, but I do know that there are plans to transfer water for the First of all, to, for everybody to understand, the middle part of Africa has virtually almost all the water resources of Africa. The northern part, that is uh, the Sahel in North Africa, is virtually water poor. And the same thing applies for the southern part, which includes the Kalahari Desert, which is also uh, very, very dry. And the, the question, which has been an old question, we didn't start now, has been, like other continents where there have been transfers of water, and the best examples are in Europe. I happen to know the Rhine system and how much the Rhine has played a role in economic development in terms of transport and also the interconnection between the river systems and canal systems, whether something like that could it be done. Yeah. I can assure you that um, 
under the umbrella of the African Minister's Council of Water, there has been a deliberate attempt to assess whether it is possible to do it, and if so, what the guidelines should be, taking into account the economic, social, and, uh, and uh, environmental concerns that can be raised. And a good example of it, at least on the paper stage, is the tra a proposed transfer from uh, the Congo River, which co uh, comprises about 40% of all Africa's surface water resources, to the Lake Chad, which has shrunk by about 90% since 1973. That plan has been, as so far as I know, is being sponsored for feasibility studies by the members of the Lake Chad Basin Commission. There are five countries and now six countries, so far as I know. And I don't know the exact results of it, but I do know that they have it, uh, mobilized internal resources to assess the feasibility of it. Okay, uh, my wrap-up is not going to be very long, don't worry. And I will try to make it clarifying as well. Um, I think we have talked about the what, you know, what next. You know, we have sort of discussed a few targets here that we want to see uh, beyond 2015. We have also talked quite a lot about the how. Eh? What, how can we make this happen? And that relates to the challenges, in my view. And also, we have raised some concerns and some comments on, on how we can make this happen and what really concerns us on this. Um, in relation to the what, I think uh, uh, very, very early in the, in the debate, uh, something was put on the table, this idea of the universal coverage, the focus on the bottom billion that was there, that's something very strong that is coming through that we need to look at. Um, these new targets need to consider the, the resolution on, on the water and sanitation as a human right. And I think uh, Robert Bowles was very clear that we will need, in, those tar in that target, in 100% coverage, we'll need to look at sub-items like accessibility, safety, acceptability. So th that target will be disaggregated. That seems to me what, what was being said here. Um, a very important message from Kosom, and I think all also from, from you too, was uh, related to discriminate. Discriminate. That was very, very strong here in the panel. Now, we, the bottom billion are not just anybody. The bottom billion are generally women. The bottom billion are generally children. So really look at that and, and be careful that that's where we are talking about. And that also has implications in terms of the how. So it is not just any solutions. A lot of the times to reach women and to reach solutions for women, you need female to be there because of cultural reasons. So that was a very, very strong message. Thank you, Kasim, for that. There, are also, there were also targets in relation to increased efficiency. That, that was a very strong message from the Eastern European things. And uh, increasing efficiency on networks, on treatment, but also increasing efficiency, and that was, I came quite strongly on institutional sort of management systems that we have. So let, let's look at that also very closely. Uh, from, the, from the floor, there were some issues also about climate change and the need to think about goals on water resources management, on scarcity management that don't seem to be so much in the MDGs and we need to make them more operational. So that's as far as it goes for the world. Eh? In relation, there were also some cautions that came several times in the conversation here in relation that um, uh, consider what we can really do. So don't, don't, we shouldn't really get targets on the floor that then we cannot do. And, and this idea of progressing realization. And so in the, the way that we, that we set our targets, uh, we'll need to consider that, you know, that there is an issue of progress and we need to be able to measure the progress to be able also to to provide some positive feedback to those that are doing better, as, as we mentioned in Africa. Um, and also very important, the, the idea that, that, uh, that we need to consider the commitment of political leaders, that where there is that kind of commitment, like in Africa, and where we have a context of growth, of economic growth, that improvement on the achievement of the targets is more possible and more viable, but uh, you know, you have to, it's not all about um, uh, investing or giving importance to water, it's also about the context of economic growth that facilitates achieving the, the MDGs. That, that's what I got from you as well. In relation to the how, 
uh, you know, the challenges for, for, the, for beyond the, the 2015. Um, again, the issue of making targets realistic, create, um, create indicators that, are, that support the new targets, uh, generate data and monitor gender disaggregated, so that was very important here. Uh, invest where is needed, so we are talking about women, rural, urbanizing slums, and think about actions ex ante. You know, you were saying that you know, once you have the problem, it's very difficult, so think about ahead. And that's coming very strongly also in this, in this whole week, I think, the idea of planning before you get the real problem in the, in the slums. And, um, and I think uh, in terms of, of some of the concerns and issues that had been discussed here, I think uh, there were some issues here raised about the need for a smooth process beyond 2015 or how we are going to really achieve those new targets, how we are going to discuss them, what, how we are going to get into that, some kind of political agreements. And so the Robert Bowles was very strongly saying that he expects to have a smooth uh, uh, progress towards that and the new, and the new agreements will be, will be okay, but, but they will be, you know, we have to, to monitor the discussions. There were also issues here in terms of, of really uh, that climate change adaptation is not enough in the targets that we are he, uh, here, we heard that from the, from the floor. Uh, people welcome that we are now moving into quality indicators. So I think that was also something good. So it's not just, uh, we, maybe we weren't defining good, well enough what do we mean by access to safe water or uh, you know, adequate sanitation, and now we are really moving into some more detail on that. And uh, I think there were also some, some ideas on, on the, the need to be, to be aware on how we are accounting for progress. I think there were some people here who were saying that, you, you too, know, that, that maybe um, uh, we are not really taking into consideration that some, there is some important progress at local level, and by looking at general numbers, we're not really looking at that. That's, that's a really, I have heard that several times from African countries, that we are not really looking at, at the real effort that has been taken, and, um, yeah, and also to the need to, to really go into the community levels, that, that a lot of the efforts have been done at national levels and we really need to go to the community levels, and the new indicators need to reflect this as well, so the action is taken at community level. I think that, that was what I got from, from the presentations and I got from the discussions, so I think uh, we have some very good feedback in terms of the what, some of the challenges, some of the concerns. And with this uh, wrap up, I thank you very much for keeping with us until this very late uh, hour. And uh, hopefully we will be able to consider all this feedback that you have had and, and take it with us and, and uh, to be able to rephrase the way we are looking at beyond 2015. Thank you. For